axial skeleton, which as its name indicates, lies along the longitudinal axis of the body. It has several bones, bones of the skull, the hyoid bone, this bone, which is U-shaped and is present in the neck, then the vertebrae, and then the, uh, the bones and cartilages of the thoracic cage, ribs, costal cartilages, and the sternum. So these are the bones that are colored in blue. And the other part of the skeleton, which is called the appendicular skeleton, it is the bones of the upper limb and lower limbs and the girdles that are related to them. The vertebral column, obviously, it supports the body and head. The head, the occipital bone, articulates with the first cervical vertebra, which is called the atlas. It surrounds and protects the spinal cord because the brain continues with the spinal cord through foramen magnum and acts as, as provide attachment sites for the ribs and muscles. These are the pieces of the vertebral column, the vertebrae. We have seven, so as the giraffe has seven vertebrae in the neck, seven cervical. The first one is called the atlas. That's why the joint is called atlanto-occipital joint. And we have 12 thoracic. We have five lumbar in the lumbar region. And then in the sacrum, it's a single bone. This is the sacrum here. It's a single bone, but in fact, it is five fused segments, vertebral segments, but they fuse together to form single bone. And then we have the coccyx. The coccyx is the tailbone. In animals, it's very long, but in humans, it, this is the remnant of the coccyx. It's very short, and, in, and it is formed of four tiny, small segments fused together. Now, this is important to um, understand here. This is a, like a, a typical vertebra. You will find that in any vertebra, there is a body of the vertebra. Here we are looking at the vertebra from above. Here we are looking at the vertebra from the side. This is anterior and this is posterior. This is anterior and this is posterior. So this is the body of the vertebra. As you will see here that the body will, is the part of the vertebra that withstands the weight. So the weight of the body comes through here and it transmits the weight to another vertebra. So as we go down in the vertebral column, the force will increase because the weight is uh, increasing. So thoracic, for example, cervical vertebra, you don't expect that they have big bodies. But as we go down and reach the lumbar region, the bodies will become larger and larger until we reach the sacrum. And then the size will become smaller because the body weight is going to be transmitted to the lower limb. So the body is the weight-bearing part, and then after that, we have the arch. So this is the vertebral arch. The arch and the body, they surround a foramen, which is called the vertebral foramen. And if we have vertebrae on top of each other, like we have it here, this results in the formation of a canal. Multiple foramina on top of each other will form the vertebral canal. Attached to the arch are processes. We have two on the side, like two upper limbs, like that transversely, so they are transverse processes. And then we have one posterior, which most of, in most of the vertebrae it is, is tapered, so it looks, that's why it's called spinous process. And you expect that these processes, they will receive the muscle attachments and cause the movements. But in addition to that, we have a superior and inferior process, actually double. So a pair of superior, a pair of inferior articular processes because these processes provide another place where the adjacent vertebrae can articulate with each other. So they are articular processes, but they are not weight-bearing. They allow movements between the vertebrae. The weight-bearing is the body. And so when the bodies articulate between each other, uh, they articulate with a fibrocartilage in between. Remember, the fibrocartilage is the strongest type of cartilage in the body. The arch is formed of two pieces. This is one piece called the pedicle, which is the part of the arch between the body and transverse process. And then we have the lamina, which is more flat, lamina, laminated. So this is the flat part again. This is another lamina between the transverse and spinous process. So we have pedicle, lamina, lamina, pedicle equal the arch. The, the pedicle has a notch. If you look at the pedicle here, there is a small notch here and there is a big notch on this side. If you bring two vertebrae together, these two notches will come like this. They face each other. You have a notch from the vertebra above, 
and a notch from the vertebra below and so you will have a foramen and this foramen is between the vertebrae so it's called intervertebral foramen it is not a defect in the vertebra it is not a hole in the vertebra but it is because two vertebrae come together they have notches and so this creates a foramen it's not a hole in one bone but two notches in adjacent bones it is the intervertebral foramen and it is through the intervertebral foramen that the spinal nerves leaves the spinal cords and become distributed in in the body and here this is the joint between the two vertebrae between the two vertebral bodies where there's a lot of weight bearing here so the joint is a secondary cartilaginous joint it is called intervertebral disc and this disc consists mainly of fibrocartilage in fact it consists of a rim of fibrocartilage an outer circular rim of fibrocartilage called annulus annulus means rounded circle annulus fibrosis and in the in the middle there is a again cartilage in the form of a gelatinous material or a mucoid material and it is called the nucleus pulposus so there is an annulus fibrosis and nucleus pulposus and this the presence of this will make it withstand a lot of pressure and at the same time it acts as a shock absorber that's why we have the nucleus pulposus and so you can expect that if you are standing for a long period of time then at the end of the day the nucleus pulposus and annulus fibrosus will get compressed becomes a little bit thinner and there are a lot of these in between the vertebrae so at the end of the day if you are standing for a long period of time you will become one centimeter shorter than when you wake up because of the compression in the intervertebral disc so these intervertebral discs they withstand a lot of pressure it is how the body weight is transmitted through them and they act as shock absorber especially the ones that are present in the lower part of the vertebral column in the lumbar region not on the sacral region sacral region we don't have them because the sacral segments are fused together and the body is going to be distributed to the lower limbs so we are talking about the last two lumbar vertebrae the intervertebral disc between l4 and l5 and the intervertebral disc between l5 and s1 usually these are subjected to a lot of pressure and they might slip as a common term is used but the the scientific term is that they herniate what happens is that the inside the gelatinous material which is present inside the donut here it herniates through the uh, annulus fibrosus and as it herniates posteriorly it's going to compress the structures that are present in the vertebral canal and these are nerves so this results in nerve damage, uh, resulting in what we call sciatica. The patient will have paralysis, will have pain, paresthesia, tingling because of that. And in order to relieve the tension, to relieve the pressure here, they usually make an incision at the back and they remove the lamina with the spinous process of that vertebra. And that's why the operation is called laminectomy, cutting of the lamina. Remember the lamina, which are part of the vertebral arch, the flattened part of the vertebral arch. The vertebral column has curvatures. In the fetus, it has a single curvature, as you can see it here, as it's called the primary curvature. But then later, a second curvature, two secondary curvatures will form, one in the cervical region, and this is the first one to form in uh, afterlife, is when the baby tries to hold his head because you know at the first three months of life the baby cannot hold his head but when the baby holds his head this curvature which is convex forward not concave convex is called the cervical curvature appear and then after that when the baby starts to uh, sit and especially to walk there will be another curvature a lumbar curvature this is another secondary curvature which is convex forward there are abnormal curvatures like scoliosis, which is a lateral curvature, and kyphosis, which is accentuation of the thoracic part of the, of the vertebral column, and lordosis, which is an accentuated curvature of the lumbar region.